We live in influential times. I say that because our lives are influenced in one way or another by our beliefs, our environment, and relationships, which either affect or enforce our own mindset. In the case of economic models, it's no different. Capitalism, despite its popularity, has always carried its fair share of flaws, which have become the catalyst for another group of thinkers, the socialists. Hey there audience, I'm Sparks360, and in this video, I'm going to share with you four early socialist thinkers in this episode of Economic History. As a prelude, the origins of socialism are debatable. Some say it existed since our primitive ancestors, while others say it emerged as a response to the Industrial Revolution. But I think most of us can agree that there is a prominent gap between industrial and pre-industrial societies. In this case, pre-industrial life had traits that can be considered socialist, such as limited variations in social classes, scarce division of labor, and collective ownership in the case of the tribe. These practices weren't seen as part of an ideology, but practices that were needed in order to survive. When did these practices become solidified into an ideology? Well, let's look at 18th century Europe, specifically France, where in 1789 it is in the grip of revolution. What caused this revolution? Well, beginning with the creation of an absolute monarchy under Louis XIV, there are five key reasons. The first was the dividing of the population into three estates, with the common people being the majority, but with the nobility having 30% of the land. Moreover, they had a weak and corrupt monarchy, which only served the interests of the nobility, and was incapable of acting on behalf of the nation. Financial mismanagement was another reason, such as massive debt pilled up from previous wars, bad harvests, and the third state having to pay all the taxes. The Enlightenment was another one, which questioned the absolute rule of the king and the authority of the Catholic Church that ruled France at that time, and the sending of French troops to support a country whose values and interests are the complete opposite of the French kingdom. Thus, in 1789, it all culminated into the French Revolution, a turbulent time of restructuring the monarchy into a republic, replacing the authority of the church with a new concept such as the cult of reason, and of course, the mass killing of the nobility, turning the revolution into the terror. The French Revolution was paramount to a new wave of questioning, the utopian socialists. Made of reformists, revolutionaries, common people, even nobility who had a change of heart, their theories consisted of the opposition to society's ruling classes, the unhealthy conditions of the workers, and ways of supporting the common good of humanity. Among those who have witnessed the French Revolution, one of them stood out as being one of the early socialist thinkers, Henri Saint-Simon. Born of French nobility, Simon's ideas weren't considered socialists until future thinkers labeled him as such after his death. Instead, looking at his time, he might as well be considered the creator of his own personal ideology. To quote Albert Linderman in his book, European Socialism, For some time, Saint Simon appeared to be a typical liberal aristocrat. After all, Simon was a fan of how capitalism brought about industrialization, productivity, and innovation. But furthermore, we read, Saint Simon condemned kings, nobles, and prelates as useless and parasitical. In many ways, Simon was the precursor to historical materialism, believing that capitalism played an important role in creating the industrial society we live in today. But soon, that same system will eventually become outdated and incompatible with holding up society, thus leading to a reorganization of society into something more practical and protective. For Simon, this new society would be one where the government would be run by people of industry and science, who will produce the common needs of the people. To quote Landerman once more, Saint Simon was sincerely concerned about the plight of the poor, but he rejected social economic equality as a sterile negative concept. He believed that society required a fundamental reorganization of society, so that destructive individualism and antisocial competitiveness could be remedied and so meaningful equality of opportunity could be established." End quote. And so, Simon Simon's ideas, despite its archaic nature, would go on to evolve under future theorists, emphasizing the need of society where the needs of the people are met, leading to an inclusive, equitable society. While Simon was among the first to oppose the ideas of capitalism, there have been others who fashioned his values into their own ideas. 
meet Charles Fourier. At first glance, Fourier would come off as unrealistic, delusional, and radical for his day. For example, he writes of oceans of lemonade, the North Pole being more mild than the Mediterranean, women and men having four lovers and four partners, and androgynous plants that copulate. W what? On a more concrete level, he was a firm opponent of patriarchy and the family unit, as practiced in the West. He was even the first to coin the word feminism. Economically, Foyer focused on the issues of commerce. Commerce, as defined by Foyer in his pamphlet on free exchange, says this. To define it more precisely, commerce is a mode of exchange in which the seller has a right to defraud with impunity and to determine himself without arbitration the profit which ought to be received. The result is that the seller is the judge of his own case, while the buyer is deprived of protection against the rhapsody and cheating of the seller. He elaborates further on its consequences in The Vices of Commerce. What Foyer is getting at is this. There is an exclusive group of people who could outsource jobs, overspeculate, could reduce production to keep market value, and live off the profit without the consumer ever having a say in its affairs. As opposed to Simone's alternative for a centralized society to distribute man's needs, Foray proposed for a society to be organized into self-sufficient communes called phalanxes, which would give the people in the commune, regardless of age and gender, to not only have their needs met, but to own the means of production. In short, what can we gain from Foyer? He gave claims to why capitalism is flawed, specifically its practice of alienation. Thus, Foyer was one who saw the best in humanity when found in the common ownership of the people that makes life possible. The time of utopian socialists were those who lived through the French Revolution, with the exception of one individual. Louis Blanc. Born in Spain, 1811, Blanc believed that socialism can be done by reform, specifically the ratifying of laws that help reduce the plight of the working class. This can be done by national workshops to provide the poor with opportunities to work. In fact, he would be the father behind public works policies, as seen later in the Great Depression. But let me summarize. Blanc argues that the government has an obligation to provide people general needs, and the changing of the capitalist system can be done by reform via government administration. However, Blanc's plans are a bit rigid, as he doesn't take into the fact that economic power leads political power, and not the other way around, which can lead to these policies being reversed in a short time. But if there's one thing we can gain from Blanc, it would be this. At some level, there are needs that can be met, for a healthier, productive society. For the most part, I covered people who either written about socialism or enacted a few reformed policies under its genre. But there was one who took a more radical approach, Francois Noël Babouf. A journalist and agitator during the French Revolutionary period, he can be considered the first radical communist of his time. His start to socialistic ideas was during his time assisting the nobility in asserting their feudal rights over the peasants. After that, he went to agitate against the system he worked so closely with. His magnum opus, The Manifesto of Equals, Babouf outlined the needs for equality as the most important need of man. Quote, Equality, the first wish of nature, the first need of man, the first bond of all legitimate association. End quote. Furthermore, Babouf continued to harbor on these needs of equality, with the exploitation of the masses and the common ownership of land with words like this. We declare that we can no longer put up with the fact that the great majority of work and sweat for the smallest of minorities. We lean towards something more sublime and more just, the common good or the community of property. No more individual property in land. The land belongs to no one. We demand, we want, the common enjoyment of the fruits of the land. The fruits belong to all." End quote. Babouf goes on to proclaim a new system that would provide for the common needs of the Republic. Line 24 read like this. Let there no longer be any difference between people than that of age and sex. Since all have the same faculties and the same needs, let there then be for them but one education but one nourishment, 
they are satisfied with one son and one heir for all. Why then would the same portion and the same quality of food not suffice for each of them?" End quote. Such a manifesto was radical for its time. His ideas eventually gained popularity, and in 1796, a coup was planned to overthrow the newly formed French Republic, but soon failed, ending in the decapitation of Babouf himself. To end his section, Babouf said something that would either intimidate us or have become true for a while. The French Revolution was nothing but a precursor for another revolution, one that is greater, more solemn, and which will be the last. To give a summary of these thinkers, I'm going to discuss their core traits that they all more or less supported, a few critiques, and supporting claims. The most prominent trait they all supported was equality, the collective, and everything that enforces equality, such as common ownership, democracy, and giving everyone a better quality of life. This is combined with a second trait, unconditional rights. This is the idea that there are certain rights or needs that people are naturally entitled to. You don't need to give anything away for that entitlement. These values are already quite moral. However, these values are rigid to say the least. For how can such positive ideas as equality and looking out for your fellow man lead to the mass starvations in Ukraine, the gulag system in Siberia, the killing fields in Cambodia, or the repressive regime in Venezuela? These atrocities have their unique circumstances. But I wish to address three specific reasons why socialism can be flawed. First, they underestimate the need of the individual to be unique and to pursue goals outside what others do. Moreover, by allowing people to look after their own interests, it gives people individual stewardship and incentive to be more productive. After all, it's the individual where everything starts and is executed. This goes on to my second argument. People can take advantage of those unconditional claims I said earlier. For socialism, it's about collective ownership. Everything is done via the group, not by individuals. This creates a dilemma where people would suspect that if they don't do all they can do, it's alright, because someone else would accommodate them. This leads to management flowing up to the highest governing body, recreating a hierarchy, turning mutual aid into force, and camaraderie into dependency. And finally, socialism tends to be simplistic. That is to say, they tend to use a one-size-fits-all solution to solve very dynamic and uniquely different situations. The problems in Group A may be very different or unique than that of Group B, and one solution may not work well for the other. Alex Tocqueville best sums this up by saying, Democracy and socialism have nothing in common but one word, equality. But notice the difference. While democracy seeks equality and liberty, socialism seeks equality in restraint and servitude. But if I can dissect one important point from socialism, it would be this, that we are a connected species. As seen with the massive networking of companies to all parts of the globe and bringing about a more advanced society, it has also left us in a state of vulnerability and alienation from these entities that we depend on for our needs. Having awareness of how things are operated is important, and having a say in that operation is just as important. It can prevent mistreatment of workers, the environment, it can improve productivity, resilience to economic shocks, and most of all, keeping the best interests of the people at heart. <laughs>